Okay, Hare Krishna. Welcome again. We had just a few with us to begin with. I think more devotees will be coming. But let's start with text 37, 437. So I guess I'm asked, could I ask someone to read? There's only two of you here with us, Mother Chandavali, who's normally reads as well. She's just taking a phone call. So would you like to read Payal, if I pronounced that correctly? Yeah. Yes, Prabhu. Okay. Did, did I get the pronunciation correct? Yes, Payal. Payal, okay, nearly correct. Yes. <laughs> okay, please, go ahead. Text 37. You can read the Sanskrit as best as you can. Don't worry if you don't get it spot on, although you'll probably read it quite well, I should think. And then the translation and Srila Prabhupada's purple. And I have a few notes here on this verse for your interest. Okay. 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 Athe damasi samrito nir yam vyasma sat kurute arjuna gyanagni sarva karmani vashma vashma sat kurute tatha. Very good. Yes. And a translation. As a blazing fire turns firewood to ashes, O Arjuna, so does the fire of knowledge burn to ashes all reactions to material activities. Papar. Uh, perfect knowledge of self and su uh, super self and of their relationship is compared herein to fire. This fire not only burns up all reactions to impious activities, but also all reactions to pious activities, turning them to ashes. There are many stages of reaction. Reaction in the making, reaction uh, fructifying, reaction already achieved, and reaction a uh, priori. But knowledge of the constitutional uh, position of the living entity burns everything to ashes. When one is in complete knowledge, all reactions, both a priori and a posteri posteriori, are consumed. In the Vedas, Bra Brihad. Brihad, Brihadyankya Upanishad uh, 4.422, it is stated, Udde Uhei Vesye Ete Tarati. Amrta Sad Asadhuni. One overcomes both the pious and impious act reactions of work. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you. I'm just plugging in some of the headphones I have. One second, because I have a just here. Hare Krishna. Oh, one second, Krishna. Anyway, while I'm mucking around here trying to press the right button, <laughs> any particular questions or curiosities about this? And I, um, I was just going to actually, I want confirmation. Actually, yeah, please. You know, like as a blazing fire turns firewood to ashes, so the fire is already pres present in the wood, right? But when it comes with um, blazing fire it turns into ashes so then on the other hand we already got knowledge but when uh, but when we come in contact with like a spiritual master or senior de or devotees then the knowledge comes out now does that make sense burn to ashes could you just this? refrain the first part of your question i was a bit i was a bit distracted Please, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, like fire is present in the wood, right? Yeah. Fire is in present. So when it comes in contact with fi a real fire, then it burns and it turns into ashes. So yeah. the, so we have, the, what I'm thinking is, we have the knowledge, but when we um, come in contact, we have knowledge of like being in the material world, right? So when we come in contact with devotees, then uh, the knowledge burns all this material 
activities, you know, get rid of material activities by knowledge. Or the reactions of fruitive work, yeah. Or yes, plants. yes. Yes, yeah, it's correct. Does that mean, is that how I'm understanding? Yeah, I mean, it's more like a comment what you're saying there. Yes, if I've understood. If I want to understand it, is that, is that the right understanding in a way? Yeah, well, it's a, here, this verse specifically, there's a lot, as more is said about this particular, what Prabhupada is describing in the purple, in the Nectar of Devotion, um, chapter one, actually. It's entitled, I was just looking just before, it's called The Relief <laughs> from Material Distress. So it's interesting here, Prabhupada uses a couple of Latin words here. Mm -hmm. a, a priori and a posteriori. Oh, so these are Latin. No, priori means a previous, previous um, karmic or previous sinful actions or even previous pious activities. They are, um, the, the, the reactions to them are purified or dissolved through transcendental knowledge. Now that's interesting because when it means um, reactions to pious activities, I mean, why would that be of, you know, what, how would that be positive? Because you think that would be something good. But as we know, Srila Prabhupada explains that, for instance, if you've done pious activities, that means you are accredited due results in your next life, which may be birth in a aristocratic family or birth in a body that's free of disease or yeah, birth, et cetera, et cetera. So you still have to take birth in order to experience that pious acts, which you did in a previous life, which means you're still going to have to suffer you could say from old age disease and death so from the transcendental perspective we need to be free of pious and impious reactions so that's what it is why it's said here one overcomes both the pious and impious reactions to work and so there is something called parapta karma and proper or yeah, Ramanuja Acharya is looking at his commentary on this verse, and Prabhupada also mentions this. Prabhupada karma is basically manifest as the body which we have. So by engaging in or by developing transcendental knowledge, or also there's verses that describe just by chanting the holy name, you can be free from the reactions to material work. But here it's specifically I um, I am um, identifying transcendental knowledge. Yeah. And so one become, because if one was to become free of one's the karma, one would not have a body in order to execute devotional service. <laughs> so in other words, we still have our body and our body will go through the reactions which all bodies go through in this material world. So we may still get diseased, etc. Yeah. But Prabhupada says in an act of devotion, I hope I'm addressing your point, Mother Chandravari, or not. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, Prabhupada says in an act of devotion, I'm just reading here. Again, in, in chapter one, uh, he men mentions about the manifestation of mature, because there's, what's it here? There is, um, he quotes from the Padma Purana at first, saying, karmas or fruitive activities, they, that they give their result. So it goes like a seed. It goes like a seed. You kind of plant the seed by doing, say, a, a fruitive activity, let's just say a sinful activity. It goes like a seed in the heart, and it may not fructify until the next life. Actually, mm -hmm. the Mahabharata it describes if you've done a specific sinful act at a particular age that you did that sinful act, that's the age which it will manifest in your next life. Interesting. Okay, so if you did it at 34, it will happen at 34 in your next life, etc. So 
He mentions there's effects which are not yet fructified. They're lying as a seed. Um, there's the ones that are already mature. And Prabhupada gives examples by which that can be seen. And he mentions uh, five symptoms that one is suffering or is received is that their sinful activities are fructifying. So one is to have some chronic disease, chronic disease. One is legal implication. Another one is born in a low and degraded family. And Prabhupada also mentions one is uneducated. Very interesting, he says, or very ugly. <laughs> these are, now these are not disqualifications for taking out bhakti, of course, as we know. But we can see practically that there is persons in all of these categories we see in uh, all of human society. So that's now transcendental knowledge frees one from sinful activities which are lying in the seed form. Yeah, it frees mm -hmm. one from previous sinful activities. And also, I was reading that even as it says here, a priori, which means past. And posteriori, if I pronounce that correctly, means those sinful activities which you may somehow become entangled in, even though you have transcendental knowledge, just by being, or being in the material world, then these will not have the same effect. The example is given, just like water off a duck's back is described. I don't know if everyone's seen that. When a duck goes under the water, it comes up and its feathers are made in such a way that the water just forms balls and immediately falls off the back. It doesn't soak in. If you see that, next time you go for a walk in the park, you can look at a duck and go all under the water. So by transcendental knowledge, then even one, even if one is somehow entangled or yeah, is entangled in some type of fruitive work or some type of reaction, then because they are situated in transcendental knowledge, that will mean they will be um, still remaining their spiritual position. I don't know if I answered that the long way around. No, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, no. I, I just another thing. Why why does one when he, uh, when a seed fructifies, like uh, karma fructifies? Why does it take so long to finish that action? To, like Krishna has some kind of um, I don't know whatever he has. <laughs> well, it's according to it's according to the uh, Krishna's purposes that 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 he wants to achieve. For mm -hmm. instance, when one is entangled or one be when there's reactions coming to one, even mm -hmm. though one is engaged in devotional service, mm -hmm. it may be that those reactions will instill within the bhakta a sense of detachment from the material world. So it may yeah. be favorable. One becomes more attached to Krishna. And we generally mm -hmm. might see that then we do become more we may become more attached to our spiritual activities, hopefully, um, when we meet difficulty, then we question a bit deeper and we go a bit deeper and we call out to Krishna with a little bit more sin sincerity. So if a karmic reaction serves the purpose of bringing us towards Krishna, then Krishna may see fit to to keep that intact. But also yeah. we should understand that also Krishna may be relieving us of so much karma, but these things we, we will not be aware of. There may be many more things we were due to experience in this life if we hadn't taken to spiritual knowledge or we hadn't awoken transcendental knowledge and taken to spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada, I think, is the general example that sometimes devotees give 
think Prabhupada made this, um, he, he mentioned this where someone hurt their finger. And Prabhupada said, well, you, well, you should have got your head cut off according to your karma. I don't know if Prabhupada yes. said that, but I remember when I first joined Krishna Consciousness, then I cut myself. I was chopping vegetables in the kitchen and I cut myself. And he wrote to me, you're very lucky in your last life, you would have got your head cut off. <laughs> yeah. So according to, uh, so it also Krishna may wish to quicken one's journey through this particular life. But therefore, say, sometimes we'll see devotees will um, get cancer or die in car crashes. As you know, some of our senior devotees, or one senior devotee, specifically Tamar Krishna Goswami Maharaj, mm -hmm. he was definitely situated in transcendental knowledge and in that sense free from all karmic reactions. But he died in a car crash. So we can only conclude from that that Krishna had transcendental plans for him and wanted him to finish up things in this life for his own specific purposes. Mm -hmm. But the underlying principle which we're trying to bring across here is that we should always have faith in Krishna. Yes, ah, by yes. developing transcendental knowledge and chanting the holy name, even circumambulating Tulsi, even, we can be free of sinful reactions. That's for sure. But we will see that we will go through things in, um, in, in this life which may seem to be the same to, to some degree that a materialist may go through. <laughs> and sometimes it can be tested. Sometimes the devotees say there's like three brothers. One of the brothers takes to Krishna consciousness and the other two don't take to Krishna consciousness. Now the brother who takes to Krishna consciousness goes through all types of difficult situations, all types of trying situations where the other two brothers seem to be doing okay materially. So from a external, so from one vision, one may have some doubts. But actually, we should understand that the devotee is actually being relieved of their material conditioning. And they're on the way out of the out of the material world. But the other two brothers who may seem to be relatively free from the same, you know, uh, difficulties as the one brother who took the Krishna consciousness, they will be subject to birth and death for hundreds of millions of lives still. Yeah. <laughs> Things are not always what they seem. So that's yeah, any other questions upon that? Oh. Yeah, you said about we should have faith in Krishna that you know he will protect us kind of Okay, so then um, when you're going through karma, I mean, heavy karma, you kind of fear as well. You have fear. Though you do have faith in Krishna who is protecting, but because it's like one way, you want it your way in a way. So you kind of have fear as well. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, yes. you do. You have, yeah, you may have some apprehension. Yes. About, yes. About what one is experiencing. Karma. But at some point, we have to come to the same stage as um, Draupadi. Mm. Anyone can, and anyone know what's coming next if I mention Draupadi? Completely surrender. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. As, as we know the um, story, she was attempted to be dis, uh, disrobed. And in the beginning, and she was being disrobed by a very powerful Chatriya. Was it? Duchashan, wasn't it? Much more powerful physically than Draupadi. And she was trying to hang on almost prophetically to her sari. But then eventually, as we know, she had one hand and then she eventually let go and put two hands in the, you know, and called out, hey, Govinda. Mm -hmm. so, Come yeah, on. one thing, Nimai Mata, one, one thing, just finish okay. this thread. Um, yeah. So it's good if we can, it's good if we can develop that, you know, this first uh, tat, 
tate no kompum shishikshamano bunjana eva atmon kripam pipakam vid vag vapabe vidadam namaste chivitti mukti pa de sayabhag. This is a well known verse to devotees, it's, it's by Lord Brahma. Mm -hmm. And he describes that if someone, despite going through reactions in this world, they still keep faith in you and keep on chanting your glories. And actually, mm -hmm. they think, actually, I deserve worse, my Lord. You are so kind that you are just giving me a little token of what I actually deserve. I'm such a sinful person. Thank you so much, my Lord. I'm going to continue serving you. Then that person inherits, with that devotional mentality, they inherit, as said, the, the uh, a position in the spiritual world. So... I don't answer your question, Mother Chandra. So, Mother Chandra, really, we have to. Oh, I'm trying myself. I'm preaching to myself. So we have to conclude. We have to put our arms up. How? What can we do? Yeah, my, yeah. No, my Lord? yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that. Like even living in a damp place. Like oh, and I would say, oh, why don't you change the flat? No. I deserve this. I, I, how, why did I behave like this? I deserve oh. whatever. It's, I should get yeah. worse than now. What you're saying is now ringing in my, now I'm understanding what was that mood, you know? Yeah. I but, deserve to be treated like this. I deserve to be living like this. I deserve this. I deserve that. You know, it was like that. So yeah, I, I, know. Just, I could, I can mention something on that, but does anyone else like to add some comments to this? Thread of discussion. Not so many words yeah. today. Yeah, but yes, what I just wanted to. Yeah, say, sorry, I, but, I, no. I cut you off. Sorry, I was. <laughs> I was no, I was just trying to say uh, because you were talking about Dwapadi. But Prabhu, yeah. Dhu, uh, what? she endeavored, like she she did something uh, to protect herself. So yeah. I was just thinking. It's not that straight away, oh, Krishna, we, we call like that. Oh, we try and then we do surrender. What is that? Uh, where Where is that fine line? Yeah, mm -hmm. very good. Now, that's mm. exactly the point I wanted to address in the comment that Mother Chandravali just left us with. But does anybody else like to comment on Nitai Mata's point that she's brought up? Hare Krishna. Uh, yes, Mother Gaya, please. Lack of faith, you think you can do it. I can do it. I'll try myself. And then when no. you're completely hopeless, then you ask it to help. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so you're mentioning, so you're kind of uh, mentioning, yes, that we should make some effort. For example, if we get a sickness, um, being surrendered doesn't mean we don't go to the doctor and we just depend on Krishna. <laughs> no, we should go to the doctor and try and, and try and be cured. You know, we should always act for self-preservation. Yeah, we should not try and imitate. You could say, Lord Maharaj, in when he was being attacked by his father. But, but there will come a point. That I think Mother Gaya is mentioning. I mean, there will come a point where it becomes quite obvious that no matter which way you turn, left or right, up or down, mm -hmm. in and out, what medicine you go to, what doctor you go to, or what you do, it's coming at you. And at that point, you just got to be like, mm -hmm. you just got to say, okay, Krishna, what do I have to learn from this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do I have to learn? I wish I could, there's one picture which I, <laughs> I came across some time ago, and I want to try and find it. Again, it was a picture of a, of a bird sitting on the fence with torrential rain coming down. And the bird was, didn't, wasn't finding shelter, just sitting on the fence in this torrential rain with his wings tucked in and his head tucked in. <laughs> so in other words, it was picturing that sometimes we just got to face the rain. So linking up to Mother Chandravali's point, she mentioned about living in a damp place. I know it's Krishna's arrangement, but actually if you're living in a damp place, you should not live in a damp place because you get sick. No, it can, no, no. It, can, it, it can damage your lungs. So we should yeah, not... Sorry, sorry, unless I got in at the wrong end of the stick. Explain that it was like 
um, I deserve to be in a place like not living, living like living like that, but I'm not going to make an effort. I deserve this. I deserve this. I deserve that. I deserve everything that's coming. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah. Mood. So, so, yeah. So how do we find that line? It's, it's going to be, yeah, just finish. It's going to be different for each individual. For example, mm -hmm. who's that? Um, Kolobetra Shuddha. We know the story. Devotees know that story. He he was living in abject poverty, yes. and he had, he had holes in his roof, yeah. and he didn't even bother to get it fixed. He just got some type of umbrella and sat there in his house when it rained. He made no effort whatsoever. So it's going to be different for different devotees how far they may go to go to to try and maintain a particular status quo. But ultimately, we want to depend upon Krishna. Yes, someone was uh, speaking then, and I. Yeah, Prabhu. Um, Please, I yes. Mean, uh, if we say that, uh, as uh, Chandravali Mataji said, that we deserve it, that means, you know, you know kind of we are uh, like uh, punishing ourselves that I deserve this punishment, whatever situation I'm in. But if uh, we just um, uh, take the look in a different angle, like whatever we are having, uh, and whatever Krishna gave us, that's uh, we have to be content in that. That contentment yeah. has to yeah, be yeah. there, so that uh, we will um, we we will have faith in Krishna. That whatever Krishna is doing, that's best. Whatever situation I'm living, that's the best. Uh, yeah, uh, instead of saying I'm deserving this, that means kind of like <laughs> I, I don't know if uh, I feel that it's kind of like. Oh, whatever okay i'm and that's the punishment i'm getting or or we should say whatever krishna is giving that's the best for me and whatever will happen krishna will happen for the best you know that will happen for the best uh, yeah I mean, well what um, what you're saying is correct but the this verse which i quoted from our lord brahma um tata tema kompon it does mention this as a devotee's mentality. Generally, when they're going to be put in very trying, trying, difficult situations, their view will be generally a saint, you know, a saintly view which they have is that the Lord is so kind that He's only given me a token, you know, because of my sinful acts, lifetime after lifetime, I deserve a lot more worse than this. It's difficult to understand from a material perspective. Um, but this is the mentality of a saint, you know, where they feel, yeah, they feel themselves as deserving much worse than what's actually been given to them. Now, it's not, it, from a materialistic point of view, it may sound like one is condemning oneself. But so that's why it's difficult, it's difficult to understand from a material perspective. But this is how a devotee thinks. Uh, you think. But your point is still valid, very valid. You know, what's the point I was just thinking of? Just, uh, yes, uh, sorry. Hare Krishna Prabhu, just yes. because you said this point, I was thinking, we, I don't know, but I'm talking from my side, uh, I won't be able to think, oh, I do, uh, um, sometimes, oh, I will always think, no, I deserve more. So, I... I was thinking, for me, uh, personally, how Mahaprabhu says, whatever the way you handle me, I will, you will be my worshipable Lord. That would be a better way for me, personally. To yeah, think. And, and, and I think you're summarizing really what we're trying, what, um, what we're describing. That every, yeah. That we, yeah. And I was yeah, also because, thinking... That's Mahaprabhu. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Prabhu. Yeah. You've got it. So, yeah, so also on the point, I think Mother Payal, she was mentioning on that point as well, is that um, we shouldn't over-endeavor in this world like a materialistic person, but we shouldn't under-endeavor as well and live like a, and live unnecessarily like someone who's destitute with uh, no home, etc. So where to draw the line? especially as we're on the spiritual path. But generally, we accept those things which, are, which is according to our karma. So these things will flow to us easily. 
these things will come to us seemingly without much effort. Why? Because it's our karma. You know, I always give the example, if you want to know what your karma is, excuse me if you heard me say this before, but just look out your window and look what view you have <laughs> and, look, and, and, and look where you're living. And that's your karma. There's a certain as a certain field which you'll find yourself in, which will come, which you'll be born into and will be naturally ob obtained by you without much effort. That's called your karma. So that means you can, that means you can concentrate on spiritual development because you're not living like a materialist in trying to obtain things which are beyond your karma. One, because you're not going to get them anyway. And this is, someone needs to mute out there. Let's see, do some muting. One second. I think it's Chandra Rolly. <laughs> One second. Let's put it. Uh, <laughs> I can't find the button. Okay. Okay, I've muted Chandravali with the crying grandchild. <laughs> Excuse me. So where was I? Yeah. Um, yeah, so things will come, you know, things that come to us. Yeah, so we should. So, but the material world or the material atmosphere tempts us and teases us to try and obtain things which are beyond their karma. For instance, you will see an advert of a very wealthy person, or as you'll see a picture of the lifestyle of a very wealthy person. That's their karma. See, this is materialistic society in comparison to a classic Vedic society, where everyone learns to be satisfied by hearing and chanting about the whole, about Krishna. And whatever they see whatever Krishna sees fit to give them. That's why um, we see the Indian psychology, although it's fading for sure, but the Indian psyche or psychology is that they're easily, they're quite humble um, in that they easily accept their means in a, in a traditional sense. And they're not envious of persons who have more than them. They accept their lot but they get their happiness from hearing and chanting about the Lord. So it doesn't leave them with a sense of envy and trying to get things which is beyond their karma. Anyway, I think we're going a little bit off the track, but you know, any comments upon that, we'll try and get back in line with this particular verse. Why was I speaking on that subject? We're speaking about, yeah, I think. It's because I was asking you questions. Yeah. About um, living, how we want living. Yeah, how one's living and, and to draw the line, you know. So or how so, one's feeling when they get down. Yeah, yeah. So this is why Bhagavad Gita is very good. It's actually teaching us and the teachings of Krishna to to our junior. It's telling it's teaching us how to live in this world, what type of attitude we can have towards our material situation. But the wonderful thing is, is that just by this discussion we're having on, on the Bhagavad Gita, we're actually becoming, know it or not, we're becoming free from sinful reactions just by developing transcendental knowledge. Yeah. Now, the next verse describes it doesn't happen overnight. It takes some time to develop. That will be described. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's before we just spend the whole class on one verse, let's probably read another verse and let's see where we go. So text 38, someone would like to read text 38? Got a few more with us now. I can read, but Sanskrit will be a bit funny. I will try. If anybody oh, else wants to read it. No, go ahead. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure we won't laugh. <laughs> okay. Go on. Text city Nahi Gyani Nasadrisham Pavitram Ihavidyate Tatswayam Yoga Samsita 
Kalend Atmani Vindate translation. In this world, there is nothing so sublime and pure as transcendental knowledge. Such knowledge is the mature fruit of all mysticism. And one who has become accomplished in the practice of devotional service enjoys this knowledge within himself in due course of time. Purport. When we speak of transcendental knowledge, we do, do so in terms of spiritual understanding. As such, there is nothing so sublime and pure as transcendental knowledge. Ignorance is the cause of our bondage, and knowledge is the cause of our liberation. This knowledge is the mature fruit of devotional service. And when one is situated in transcendental knowledge, he need not search for peace elsewhere, for he en enjoys peace within himself. In other words, this knowledge and peace culminates in Krishna consciousness. That is the last word in Bhagavad Gita. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, any particular comments here? This is a nice verse, so I did learn this verse. I actually, I learned this chapter at one point, but I definitely need to brush up on it. I've lost a few verses, but I remember memorizing this verse at one time a couple of years, three or four years ago very nice verse um, there's a few words here where i was looking up in different commentaries um one here this is again by i think it's from vishnu of chakravata tarko just for your interest he says by practicing nishkam karma yoga so anyone could say what nishkam karma yoga is when one is not at that, sorry, not Carry on. Okay. So when one is not attached uh, with the you know, fruit of their activity, that's it. Correct. Yeah, nishkam karma. One's acting in the sense of duty, regardless. You know, doing it dutifully. Yeah. So by practicing nishkam karma yoga, this knowledge which is described here is not obtainable it's only obtained after described some time not in not immediately yeah so as his verse describes um he enjoys this knowledge within himself in due course of time so it's not like flicking a switch we we wish it would be that easy <laughs> but as one engages in the process of bhakti then one will apply themselves, and as they apply themselves to to different degrees, then Krishna will bless one with what's described here as uh, pure transcendental knowledge. Yeah. So it's not like you walk into a temple and you you get downloaded transcendental knowledge. It it will manifest but it manifests according to one's purification of heart, a pure according to how one applies the practice of Krishna consciousness. But for sure, in due course of time, one, I think it says, as another verse, one can enjoy this knowledge within himself, within himself or herself. One can enjoy this knowledge. Oh, it says it here. What was that? Yeah. Right in front of me, enjoys this knowledge within himself or herself in in a due course of time. Yeah. So some of us might have might have had that experience. The other day, I was waiting at the airport for a friend to come, and um, you know, at the airport I was waiting in Terminal Five, Heathrow, and I always like to watch. I don't know. I, don't know, I always like to watch people greeting each other after being separated for some time. Such happiness, such joy, you know. For, for some moments, there's a little bit of joy in their life, you know. And so otherwise, it's generally subject to various stresses and strains. And they see, one time I was at an airport, and a mother came through the doors, and her young children were waiting. And... And the mother just, and the young children spontaneously ran to the mother. And the mother just pushed a trolley in any particular direction and just went running towards the children. 
And then she took them up in the arms and there was tears coming from her eyes. And, you know, so, you know, what I was, appre what I was appreciating, I was appreciating for a few minutes, I was appreciating Krishna's, um, how everyone's being moved by Krishna. You know, and everyone is, be, yeah, Krishna is directing the wanderings of, of all living entities. So I'm just trying to explain for, for some time, for a few minutes, I was actually viewing, it was like I was watching a Bhagavatam class. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a Krishna's energy become very much, very much profound to me. And I was, I was there, it was like I was enjoying this knowledge within that everyone is subject to a particular type of karma. And this lady was very happy. I was happy because she was happy, but I knew actually that life is a mixed bag. She's not going to be happy like this all the time. Anyway, I'm going on a bit, but I'm just trying to give a little example of sometimes we should, we can experience this where we, in, in due course of time, we can enjoy the knowledge of Krishna consciousness. Anyway, any comments on that? Anything to share in that regard? Yeah, there, there's nothing more sublime to have in this world than transcendental knowledge. Much more sublime than winning the lottery, believe it or not. <laughs> Much more sublime than being wealthy. Much more sublime than being famous, etc., etc. You know, all these things are temporary. And so, well, I was huge. thinking. Yes, I was please. I was referring to your observation of the echo. I thought okay, how yeah. Krishna will be happy, how much Krishna will be happy, and that will be a permanent happiness for both sides. When he, uh, when when we when we go to him, how much he would be happy? Yeah, um, that's a very good point, and that's the and a few years ago I had that realization at the airport as well. Yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. Yes, yeah, so how much. Krishna will be happy when we actually return to him after billions and billions of lifetimes. When we actually return to his loving embrace. Wow. Uh -huh. That's the story yeah. of Gopal Kumar mm. and that yeah. picture that we know. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so in this world, there is nothing so sublime and pure as transcendental knowledge. Such knowledge is a mature fruit of all mysticism. And one has become accomplished in the practice of devotional service, enjoys his knowledge within himself in due course of time. And it comes, it comes, uh, you could say we read and we study and we try and remember and we try and apply the knowledge. But then there will be vigyan. According to our surrender, Krishna will make that knowledgeable, or will manifest that knowledge tangibly within our hearts. And it will not be book knowledge. It will be factual knowledge by which we view the world. So that's called Vigyan. You know? And that's Krishna's grace and Krishna's mercy. There's that verse also in the 10th chapter. Um, I destroy the shining lamp of knowledge, the darkness born of ignorance. Gana Dipena. So Krishna will turn on the light of knowledge within our hearts. Yeah. in due course of time. So be patient. Everything okay. Can Please, I have yes. So this world, uh, ignorance is the cause of our bondage and knowledge is the cause of our liberation. Yeah. So now, even now, we act in ignorance in some ways because we don't have proper knowledge yet. Uh, we do have knowledge, but not the high knowledge. So, and then as we progress, perform devotional service, we'll progress and our thinking will change. So the knowledge, knowledge will be there more and more. Do we get reactions for acting at present in ignorance in a way that we would not act like this in future when we do make progress? Does that make sense? Um, there's a verse in the Shima Bhagavatam there's two verses that I'm looking at, at at the moment. One of the verses, let me just see if I can bring it up. One second, just bear with me. It is nice what I'm going to get to here. Shima Bhagavatam. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Shri Papa Slokas is going down. Slokas from the Shri Bhagavatam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. 11th Canto. I will answer your question. Just, uh, just as you was asking the question, this verse came to mind, which is very apt, you know. Um, this is from scrolling down. Don't uh, um, don't go away, anyone. Please hang on. <laughs> I get that. Um, doesn't good on. Keep going. It's further down than I thought. Okay, here's the verse. Deva Rishi, Buddha Nenam, Priturinam, Nakinkayo, Nayam, Granicharajan, Savatmana, Saram, Saranyam, Kotomu Kundum, Priritchikatum. Now, O oh King, one who has given up all material duties and taken full shelter of the lotus feet of, of Mukunda, who offers shelter to all, is not indebted to the demigods, great sages, only living beings, relatives, friends, mankind, or even one's forefathers who have passed away. Since all such classes of living entities are part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, one who is surrendered to the Lord's service has no need to serve such persons separately. Now, that may not seem to be so relevant to the point, but it's followed by this verse, which is, which is, So, one who is thus giving up all material engagements and taking shelter of the lotus feet of, of Hari, Supreme Personality of Godhead is very dear to the Lord. So just take part and take note of that. Is very dear to the Lord. Indeed, if such a surrendered soul somehow, it says here, accidentally commits some sinful activity. So that's the point you're making, is it, Mother Chandravali? Yeah. Yeah. The Supreme, because they've taken to devotion, they are very dear to Krishna. So the Supreme Lord who is situated within everyone's heart immediately takes the way, away the reaction to such a sin. Mm -hmm. So Krishna relieves one of any reactions to if a devotee somehow becomes entangled, unplanned for, or accidentally becomes enamored by the free modes of material nature and finds themselves engaging in irreligious activity, then they still consider, as so was going to know the verse from ninth chapter as well, Apichet Su Dracharo, Pajate Mam Ananyaba, the Supreme Lord. They're very dear to the Lord. So the Lord takes away the reaction. Mm -hmm. Did that answer the question? So it took some yeah. time to get to those verses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But it doesn't mean upon hearing that, that we take undue advantage of, yeah. of that. Because then that is committing sin on the strength of the holy name. You cannot be absolute. Okay? Yep. Yeah, anything else we can pull from this first? Let me just look at a few commentaries here. In the meantime, anyone is welcome to share or ask any questions. Um, let me read a commentary here by your someone called Keshava Kash, Kashmiri. He's an acharya from the Kumara Sampadaya. He says, in this world, nothing is as purifying as spiritual knowledge. Then he asks the question, then why is not everyone pursuing this? 
Lord Krishna explains that first one must become qualified by prolonged practice or prescribed Vedic activities performed without desire. Nishkam. Then in due course of time, if there is no interruption, knowledge will arise leading to purity of heart at which Atma Tattva or soul realization will be achieved. And here's something from Ramanuja on the Sri Vaishnav Sampadaya. As in this world and all over the material creation, there is nothing more purifying and sanctifying than the spiritual knowledge of Atma Tattva or soul realization. It is the destruction of all sin. Perfecting oneself by the easy practice of karma yoga or following the prescribed Vedic activities in a manner instructed by a self-realized spiritual master, one will naturally attain knowledge of the soul in due course of time. Okay, so we should be convinced that it's, it's much better to spend a night in reading and studying Bhagavad Gita than it is going to, what can we say, to ice skating <laughs> mm -hmm. or whatever. Whatever material things are offered to us are much better than going bungee jumping or ice skating or going to watch some Bollywood film. You know, better you sit, you know, much more sublime and pure is just to read together with, with devotees the, the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Now, if we're in a mode of goodness, we, are, we, we will be attracted to such things. If, um, if we're in a mode of passion, reading Bhagavad Gita will seem very boring. <laughs> and not enough. We want some action, man. <laughs> Let me sit there and read Gita. Let me throw an action, some action. Anyway, going off on a tangent here. Um, <laughs> any other questions or comments? Otherwise, let's look at the time, five to seven. Let's have a little peek at 4.39, shall we? And see what's there. So are we following this? It's good. These two verses in it. Nicely we've delved into these. Um, uh, yeah. Prabhu, the last, yes. last word of the purport is very interesting. We just completed the Bhagavad Gita, I felt, because it says <laughs> that the last word of the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, that's well, yeah, that's well, that's well spotted. In other yeah. words, it's an important point. This is the last word in Bhagavad Gita. So what's the last word? That the development of transcendental knowledge. Yes, yep. we don't need to look for it anywhere else. It's within space. Yeah. So the yeah. development, so just hearing Bhagavad Gita. Mm. Hearing Krishna's yeah. sublime words to, mm. to Arjuna. Yeah. yeah. In other words, ah. this knowledge and peace cul cul culminate in Krishna consciousness. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. All right, let's have a, let's have a look at the purple. Right, what to do is I was I'm thinking gonna... maybe so... Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi saw this one, and that's what he was saying. Uh, but Bhagavad Gita it gives a ray of hope when I'm disappointed. Mahatma Gandhi would have spotted yeah, this. Yeah, there's one. that nice quote on the back of the Bhagavad Gita, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Whenever I see, was it whenever I see. See, uh, there's so no hope. See confusions yeah. and no hope. No I take hope. shelter of Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita and his words, yeah, very. It's a nice. It gives me a Gandhi. smile. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Very, very well remembered. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's have a look at the time. We've got two minutes, so um, I just read the translation, and we'll leave it on the cliffhanger. And next week we'll come back to discuss it. Okay. Shadavo lapate ganam tapara samayatendriyaha ganam lapa param shantim achire in a dikachati. So shantim means peace, isn't it? A faithful man who's dedicated to transcendental knowledge and who subdues his senses is eligible to achieve such knowledge. And having achieved it, he quickly attains a supreme spiritual peace. Okay, so. Let me just quickly, oh no, yeah. So anyway, let's discuss this next week. This is describing on our side what we have to do in order to invoke Krishna's mercy in the form of transcendental knowledge. 
we have to live a devoted life, as I say, one who subdues his senses. That person is eligible to achieve this knowledge. Yeah. So let's speak about that next week, okay? Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. I feel mm -hmm. there's a few people we may thank have you, Prabhu, Hare stopped for some time. And let's join next week, okay? Thank you. Hare thank Krishna. You. Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare 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 Hare